go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone to this week's edition of the Commercial Real Estate 101 Meetup Group. Uh, for those of you guys who are tuning in for the first time, we actually started this group back in April of 2020 um, in response somewhat to COVID. Um, and the the purpose of this, um, of starting the group essentially was to become the go-to resource for all commercial real estate uh, across the nation. Um, and so obviously we're, we're very thankful that you guys were here to here today to join us. And we actually have a phenomenal guest today. Uh, it's a good friend of mine and business partner, uh, in, in a venture that we're doing here locally in Louisville called Louisville KY vacation rentals. Uh, essentially the, the group itself, uh, is focused on Airbnb short-term rentals. And today we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, short-term rental, uh, in general, like the market itself and how it applies to the commercial industry, because it's definitely become much more of a relevant topic for commercial real estate. So Barrett, welcome. Yeah. Thanks for having me on, Raphael. Oh man. It's, yeah, of course. It's great. Obviously, like, like I said, he's a good buddy of mine here locally and we've, we've, we've known each other for the last several years and it's been in fun, uh, you know, now with this new venture, but I just wanted to touch base with you thanks, uh, a little bit about, you know, who you are and what you do. Sure. Uh, yeah, um, you know, I'm a broker, uh, just founded Elodium Real Estate back in March. Um, I've been in real estate for four years. Uh, I actually got my license back in December of 2018. So I did residential first year uh, of my career. And at the end of my first year, I actually had a friend approach me about uh, starting a donut shop that he was a uh, franchisee of. So he wanted to look for locations. And uh, so I at that point, kind of jumped into commercial switch brokerages to a more commercial related brokerage. And, uh, you know, I was with them for, I guess, two and a half, three years and then started my own thing in March. Uh, so at Elodium, we're doing residential, commercial. And obviously now, uh, you know, with our thing, uh, Louisville, Kentucky vacation rentals, we're doing short term rental management, um, operating in Kentucky and soon to be Indiana. So, um, yeah, that's kind of the uh, the base. Yeah, no, it's and it's been a windy road similar to you and myself. I mean, I know for me, it was a very windy road to get into the commercial space. And obviously, in your case, you started off in, you know, other other careers and then got into real estate investing. And now you're kind of, you know, taking the plunge into the brokerage side and you've been doing so for the last year or two. But now you're taking your own uh, path into the brokerage. So it's really exciting to see uh, what's what you're going to do and take it to uh, over the next several years. But uh one thing I wanted yeah. to ask you was, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people on the call that, you know, they're they're relatively new to the the Airbnb space or short term rentals. Um, you know, I, people think Airbnb, but in reality, it's 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 short term rentals that encompasses a variety of different platforms. But what initially attracted you to, you know, the the short term rental space? Sure. Yeah. So you know, my wife and I bought our first rental property in 2015, and uh, you know, at the time we were just focused on long term rentals. That's what everyone had kind of talked to me about all the research I'd done people, you know, mentors of mine over the years, you know, they always said, get into real estate, get a portfolio going of, you know, some long-term rentals. And that way you'll have some cash flow. 30 years will be paid off. Uh, you know, you get some depreciation, you get appreciation, um, you know, just all the, the tax benefits that come with it. So we jumped into long-term uh, rentals from a residential perspective and then I think it was in 2018, you know, one of our good friends, um, you know, he mentioned that he was getting ready to turn one of his properties that he had just renovated completely into a short term rental. And it was kind of a new concept. I think there was only a handful of hosts at the time in Louisville, not being a real travel destination. It wasn't something that I ever considered as, you know, our city being a, a place that people are going to visit all that often. Um, so that was the, the foundation of it at the time in 2018, our city was going through some ordinance changes with short-term rentals. The city really indoctrinated the whole thing back in 2015. And then in, uh, the end of 2018 is kind of when I started getting into it, you know, here locally, we have to apply for conditional use permits, as you know, in, uh, in Louisville, uh, in Jefferson County specifically. So, the conditional use permit allows us to operate a residential property for a commercial use, and that commercial use is short-term rental. So anything under 30 days is, is considered short-term. Anything over 30 days is considered long-term, and therefore you don't need a 
a conditional use permit. So we were actually down at City Hall until two or three in the morning uh, at the end of 2018 uh, or 2019, maybe I can't remember the year. Um, and, and they were actually trying to put a moratorium on all short term rentals in the city of Louisville. So there was, you know, a group of us that actually sat down, you know, uh, last Metro Council meeting of the year, they were all patting each other on the back, talking about what a great job they've done as, you know, city officials. So uh, by the time that was done, it was two o'clock and they finally heard our side of everything. And uh, we ended up putting a stop to the moratorium. Now they did implement some changes. So they told us, you know, you have a 600 foot radius rule um, where you can't have another condition use permit within 600 feet of your, you know, conditional use permit property. Um, so that was really how I, I kind of fell into it. I mean, I was uh, informed of this new decision that was coming down the line. I hurried up, I threw in my application on a long-term rental that we'd had for a few years. And I figured it was in a really popular part of town. Walkability to shops, restaurants, bars, things like that was very high. And um, so that was the first permit that we ever got. And I didn't even actually operate that property as a short-term rental for another year and a half. Um, my long-term tenants stayed, you know, for, for that much longer. And then by the time they moved out, we did some renovations um, and kind of cleaned it up a little bit, furnished it. And then we started putting it out uh, on the different channels so that we could operate as a short-term rental. That's awesome. No. Yeah. And, and we'll, we'll also dive in for these guys are on, like, you know, we'll dive into the app, the commercial applications to this as well. Um, because this is, there is, there's some interesting methods to be able to approach this profit process as well. And, you know, and just to clarify with some of you guys, we may be talking about some things that are specific to our local market. I'm sure your markets are going to be different depending on where you're located, but the general rule and general ideas are going to be pretty universal across the the nation. And so, you know, you, although you may not have, you know, this exact process, the way we're describing it here, I'm sure that you, in your own local municipality, there probably is a, a ordinance or some other, you know, method to be able to own and operate a, a short-term rental. And there's going to be some markets that are much more strict than others, uh, you know, depending on, you know, the, 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 the demand for that product in, in the area. And so. Anyways, that's kind of my disclaimer before we, we kind of continue on. But one thing I was kind of curious about is, you know, obviously not every property is fit to be a short term rental. You know, I mean, there's definitely things that you need to look out for that that constitute or try to determine whether or not an opportunity is going to be worthwhile. So what are some of the things that you look out for when you're determining whether or not to, you know, pursue that? Sure. You yeah, know, that's a great question. Uh, I think most people would disagree with you in the fact that. I think everyone uh, nowadays thinks that every property is a viable candidate for a short-term rental uh, just because they hear the numbers, they hear the figures that people are earning in revenue, and they're not necessarily understanding of, of everything that goes into it. So um, great question. A couple of things that we look for, especially when you're talking about operating a residential property as a short-term rental, we're looking at the neighborhood. And we're looking at the neighbors directly next door specifically. Um, one of the properties that is in my my you know portfolio with my wife, it is in a, um, a neighborhood down by Churchill Downs, uh, you know the racetrack for the Kentucky Derby. So um, you know we knew that we would have high demand for people who wanted to come in for the racetrack. This home is actually directly across the street from a park and a giant parking lot. So parking was uh, clearly sufficient. You know, when people have their kids come travel with them, they literally walk across the street, go to the park, things like that. We thought it would be great. Um, and I bought the house as, as a burnout. You know, I think I paid 17 grand for it and it literally had to be taken all the way down to the studs and then some. Uh, and then we renovated it fully and brought it back to life and kind of modernized it. And it's great. People really love the house um, because of what we've done to it. And we put, you know, high end finishes, uh, which makes a big difference too. But one thing we have encountered with that specific property is at one point, the house uh, next door, it is also a rental property. It's a long-term rental. And there was a, a couple of instances where <clears throat> the neighbors next door uh, were being evicted, I believe. And so they were staying up all night, playing loud music, partying. And of course it was keeping our 
tenants or our residents uh, up all night. Uh, you know, it was just kind of causing a lot of issues. I think one time we had a guest that actually had to call the cops because of how loud it got. Um, and so that is one of the, you know, when it comes to residential properties, again, uh, you know, being used in this manner, you really have to take into account the neighborhood. That's, that's huge. Um, another thing, you know, you know, we're looking at potentially um, expanding into new markets, and we're always trying to figure out what areas of town are are viable. Um, if you actually look at a map, so again, this is specific to Louisville, Kentucky, but we actually have a map that shows all of the short-term rentals that are uh, that have an active registration. Doesn't mean it's all of the short-term rentals that are on Airbnb or VRBO. We do have some that operate illegally. It's just the nature of the business, unfortunately. But the ones that are uh, registered and, and um, are active show up on a map. And you can really see that it's condensed in the downtown area and then some of the surrounding neighborhoods from, you know, just extensions off of downtown. When you get out into, um, you know, the outskirts of the city, you see a lot less. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have a viable option out in those areas. In fact, you have less, you know, you have less demand, I would say, but you also have less supply. Um, and if you have people coming to visit family, they're going to try to stay nearby. Uh, you know, if you have somebody coming in, going to a specific event location, weddings, concerts, um, you know, unfortunately, funerals, things like that. We we have people that will stay in our our, you know, short term rentals that are kind of outside of the city limits. Um, so those are the types of things that we are focused on is just um, we we are kind of always trying to see what could potentially be a new up and coming area, of course. But more importantly, we're looking at some of the attractions in the area. We want to see, hey, maybe there's a brand new restaurant or bar concept going in that could be popular. Um, and, and maybe we can try to, you know, put a, a place that's in the vicinity of that. Um, so those are some of the key things that we, we are looking for. For sure. No, and, and I, I couldn't agree more. I think location, as you mentioned, is su super important with any type of Airbnb and understanding, you know, what the drivers are going to be for that. So if you're located in an area that is, you know, close to like, for example, in Louisville, Churchill Downs is a very popular, you know, destination for a lot of people in particular around the Kentucky Derby time frame, And so, you know, the clientele are going to be going to that location or the convention center or whatever else. So knowing the economic drivers of the area and determining how you're going to be able to stimulate demand is going to be pretty helpful. And then also you had mentioned, you know, I know compared to long-term rentals, short-term rentals, the, the quality of, of finishes and everything else, I'm assuming if you do have a higher quality space, then you typically can, can command more. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, for the most part, I would say, uh, you know, we don't have, for instance, let's just take granite countertops. You know, I think that's a, a good high end finish. Most people want to see in a property that they're staying at. Uh, some of our short term rentals do have granite and others don't. And, you know, I, I think it kind of speaks to the level of of just overall renovations that we've done. We've taken some of our, our previous long term rentals and converted them to short term and didn't do a total overhaul. Uh, and then some of our other ones we did. And there is certainly something to be said about the reviews that we receive from a value perspective when when people are staying at the places with the higher end finishes all the way around. Um, now, don't don't get me wrong. We're not slapping you know paint on walls and calling it a renovation. We're talking about taking drywall down, spray foaming it, making everything just as as updated as possible. Um, you know, and and I do think there is a a clear indication in the market right now where supply has increased by twenty five percent, and you know demand is only up eighteen percent. So you have that seven percent gap in um, bookings. So the people who have the higher end finishes, newer places, walkability. Um, those are our factors that certainly come into play. And that doesn't, it's not a one size fits all approach. So that it's not like every guest is looking for that exact thing. Uh, a lot of people come in and they say, I don't want to be in the busy parts of town where I can, you know, have, have 
people leaving the bars at 2 a.m. and walking in front of the place where I'm staying and waking me up. Uh, some people do kind of want to be out in, um, you know, more of the suburban environment outside of the, the main city limits. And in that instance, it doesn't necessarily matter the finishes that you've got in there. Uh, there's just less supply in those areas. So they're going to book whatever's closest to their family members and, um, you know, wherever, whatever they came in to, you know, Louisville for whatever event or attraction or uh, what have you, they are, are going to try to stay close to that. Um, so finishes yeah. again, they just don't come into play as much when it comes to that scenario. For sure. No. And I appreciate the feedback on that front. So one of the things that, you know, is, is obviously much different than any type of long-term rental situation, whether that's on the commercial end or residential end is the, is the operational, I mean, uh, standpoint. So short-term rentals are, it's a hospitality business. I mean, that's, it's literally what it is. There's a yes. lot of moving parts involved. And so what would you say are some of the most important factors to consider as you're going and determining, you know, what the operational, you know, stand, the operational systems are going to look like? Sure. Uh, and that's, that's a good question too. So it is certainly, you're in the hospitality business. You have to kind of remove yourself from the idea that you are in real estate as an investor. If, if, uh, You've heard the the term mailbox money. This is not that. <laughs> it's a very active investment. It takes a lot of time, energy. Uh, you have to put a lot of systems in place, and that is something that over the past uh, you know four years since we've we've been operating as short term rental hosts, um, it it every year there's a new implementation. Uh, you know, I think in the first year it was just trying to furnish the places that we had. Uh, cleaning them up, doing some renovations, things like that. And then the next year, uh, we had had some instances where I felt like I needed to secure my my properties a little bit better. So we installed security cameras, we installed uh, smart tech devices, smart thermostats, uh, noise aware systems, things of that nature, just to secure our properties and provide, you know, just a, an overall better product uh, for our guests as well, making sure that, you know, they've got um, you know, just high tech things to go with our high tech society. So, um, you know, and then after that, it was a matter of, okay, well, people are saying, hey, we want to see more artwork on the walls, or, you know, we want to see a bedside table here, or we want to see a lamp instead of overhead um, recess lighting, it, it's too bright. So there's always things that you're implement, implementing uh, to improve your property from a physical perspective. Um, now, when it comes to the actual, you know, the side of hosting and being a host and being a successful host um, and being, you know, a host that has integrity, that that's another thing too. There's obviously a lot of just people in any industry that may not operate with the highest level of integrity. And that's just the way society operates. But I think it goes to show that if you are operating with systems and you know how to counteract something that pops up and you, you know, uh, stay calm and you kind of keep your composure when you're talking with guests on the phone when they call you and there's an issue. Um, we've we've developed systems uh, to put in place to kind of handle that stuff. Uh, and, and that's built up through experience year after year after year of doing this. It's not like I read a book or watched a YouTube video because I don't know that that would help me. Um, and, and again, I mean, we're talking about our local Louisville, Kentucky market a lot, but in the grand scheme of things, uh, you know, whenever my wife and I traveled to another city, state, country, whatever, we stayed in other Airbnbs and we kind of know what to look for now uh, from a review perspective. And, you know, we we kind of want to stay in the local, small um, settings where, you know, they don't necessarily have to have 150 reviews for me to want to stay there. I, I kind of like the ones that are newer and, uh, you know, people kind of put more time into their properties and try to have stronger finishes on just everything. You know, did they put a board game in the closet for you to play when you get bored? Did they put, you know, playing cards out, things like that. Um, and those are all things that we've learned. I mean, again, it's the systems are, are ever changing. There's no right or wrong way to do it. You just kind of have to adapt and, and each property as well. The systems change per property. Uh, going back to the, you know, the one size fits all approach that doesn't apply. So we have properties that are lakefront. They're they're more vacation rentals than some of our urban, um, you know, properties that are 
kind of right in the, the downtown area of Louisville. Um, the people are looking for a different experience. They're looking for a different type of accommodation. So the systems we have in place for our lakefront cottages versus our, you know, Germantown residents are very different. Um, and, and we've learned that again over time and just adapted. Uh, and, and again, with the changing market too, supply going up, that has caused us to recalibrate and adapt and uh, even adopt new ways of operating to, you know, just try to appeal to more people and try to uh, pick up those weekday bookings versus just only weekend bookings. You know, you at some point, you you don't really make a living at this if you're only getting every Friday and Saturday booked. You have to have other bookings in between. So, uh, yeah, systems are important, and, and uh, we've just – yeah. We're, we're still working on the systems. No, I get it, man. And, and, and uh, again, what, what, what a lot of times people under, don't understand is, is the, uh, the, you know, the other parts of the processes that are, that people don't see is the, the cleaning crews. Like you have to get, since we are, since you are in the hospitality business and you're turning over these units, you need to have people that are going to be available within this time frame to go in, make sure the place is spotless, because that's one of the biggest complaints for guests is, you know, something either, you know, hair being on a towel or, you know, again, you're, you're, if you're paying for that experience, you want to make sure that you provide that type of, you know, clean environment for everyone. And then obviously with people going through the, the property a lot, there's a lot of wear and tear. So being able to go through the property and make sure that, you know, the, the major maintenance items are getting taken care of. And that, again, that's, that's part of the, the responsibility of, of the owner to make sure that that gets taken care of. So. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, I've made a lot of beds over the years. Put it that way. Made a lot of beds. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah it's, it's so how it goes. I know. And and you had mentioned, you know, obviously we've, we've been through this process a little bit. So I, I'd love to, for the audience to know, like, you know, some of the tools that you use to help maximize the performance of, of short-term rentals. Like, you know, obviously when you first start out, you know, you just kind of push it live on, you know, Airbnb or VRBO or whatever other, other platform. And then you kind of manage it through those systems, but I'm kind of curious, you know, some of the things you've done recently to help uh, improve the, the performance. Sure. Yeah. So it's been a pretty, <clears throat> it's, it's been an interesting year, obviously, you know, so, mm-hmm. um, you know, prior to January of this year, my wife and I handled everything very manually, you know, uh, my wife luckily is very diligent. And so she loves to look at the competition in the market to see what other people are requesting in the different areas where we have places. And she's looking at the pricing to say, Hey, this person is charging this much. Uh, This person is charging this much. And, you know, this concert's coming to town. So let's see what other people are charging. Kentucky Derby is first weekend in May, first Saturday in May. We're always looking to see what other people are charging for that to see what the market can demand. And we operated like that for the first three years. And it was, taxing and by the time we got up uh you know to almost double digit you know short-term rental properties we just no longer could do that so um, now we have operated with a uh, channel manager we started out with one uh, at the beginning of the year and they were more of an all-encompassing channel management company where they handled all of the correspondence with guests they handled um, the listing descriptions they handled setting up new listings for us. Once we provided all the information to them, they really just kind of took over. And I thought that would be great. It really sounded like it would kind of alleviate a lot of stress and concerns. Um, At the end of the day, though, unfortunately, what I realized was I want that guest interaction for myself. I I think I'm going to be able to do a better job of calming down an angry and upset guest than anyone else, because I, you know, I, I just, I know, our properties better than anyone else is going to know them. And so therefore, if there is an issue that pops up, I'm the best person to be able to handle it. You know, if, for instance, we had a, uh, I think an older gentleman, I believe he was, uh, he, he couldn't figure out how to raise and lower the shades at one of the properties. So, you know, this is when we were under management with, with the previous management company um, or the previous channel manager, I should say. And, you know, they ended up having to call me and I, I just told the gentleman, hey, you know, all you have to do is push it up and pull it down. Very simple. But that type of stuff, when you're dealing with guests, you have to really um, make it simple. That's 
the only way you can operate is to simplify as much as possible. Don't overcomplicate anything because people, A, they don't want to take the time you know, while they're on vacation to learn everything about your home. Okay, so keep it simple. Um, and, you know, really, even if they, they did want to take the time, maybe they don't have the time. If they came in for an event or something, they just are not going to be able to, you know, read through your laundry list of instructions on how to do every single thing in your home. Um, so, you know, that was something where working with a former channel management company, it was, you know, overbearing. And I, I kind of wanted to take a step back and regain control of that communication. That was big for us. Um, but th that was a good learning curve. You know, we, we learned through that channel management company, all of these other companies that are out there that assist, you know, hosts in this space from top to bottom, everything from additional insurance protection to, uh, you know, uh, assistance on pricing, uh, dynamic pricing. Um, you know, you've got tech companies out there that can send, you know, kind of a, an autonomous, you know, an autonomous message whenever somebody, um, you know, has questions or concerns or whatever. And, and Airbnb, they offer that as well. Uh, you can set up, you know, your own uh, replies and things of that nature. But these other companies do it with a little bit more of a personal touch. So there's just so much out there now uh, from a technological perspective where they can assist you in being a host. Those things do come with a fee. And a lot of them are based on a, a monthly fee of, you know, depending on how many properties you're operating or managing or, um, you know, and then there's some that will do it just per booking. So really just kind of depends. But, you know, now that we've, we've transitioned away from that first channel management company into the channel manager we're using now, I've found that it's, it's more affordable from a monthly perspective and it still allows me uh, you know, when I'm putting in my information, it'll go from, uh, you know, it, it'll put all the information on all the platforms that we're using. So uh, Airbnb, VRBO, uh, our direct booking website, and, you know, everywhere else, booking.com. So, you know, it really makes it a lot easier because previously, you know, again, my wife and I were going in, adding all the information to our listings. And as soon as we did it on Airbnb, we had to come over here and do it on VRBO. And then we had to do it over here on booking.com and so on and so forth. And it just becomes very tiring. Um, you know, it's just kind of when you're, when you're doing one, I don't know that you need all of the technology that's out there. There are certainly some things that can help. Um, but when you have, you know, when you, when you're operating at scale and you've got a handful of these things, it, it's very cumbersome. So uh, the channel manager has been big, but really the marketplace with our channel manager, being able to pick and choose some of the different companies we also uh, want to integrate with has been integral uh, to our success this year. I mean, it, it was a slow start and the transitions kind of, you know, halted our success early on, uh, not to mention, again, supply and demand changing, uh, the market changing, new properties coming on left, right and center. Um, so you know, again, we, we just adapted and now I think we're smooth sailing and, and we've uh, found a company that we're, we've been working with for, you know, a few months and we're very happy with them and, and what they're offering. But I would tell anybody, uh, you know, systems um, are important and, and part of the implementation of systems is going to be technology. Uh, you know, when you think about it, you're operating on a technology platform, Airbnb, uh, you know, VRBO is, is, I would say, less technologically advanced, and they're older. They've been around 25 years to Airbnb's 14 years. Uh, so, you know, you just have to understand the, the programs that you're, you're working with, and that kind of helps you understand how you can uh, develop new programs for yourself and work with other programs in the industry to, to make your life easier. Definitely. No, I couldn't agree more. And and like you had mentioned before regarding the channel manager, it, it allows you to integrate with a with all the different, you know, uh, you know, travel platforms out there. So it makes it a lot easier to, to to consolidate everything under one roof. And then the marketplace, there's a lot of, you know, you know, management systems out there that integrate with a lot of these different technology platforms. And, you know, you can walk through the marketplace and determine, oh, this seems like a really cool integration where you know, like you said, you, you receive a text when you check in that gives you all the check-in instructions. If you have smart locks, 
you know, it, it'll it'll provide you with a unique key that only is valid during that period of time that you're staying there. That's that's a really cool uh, security integration that a lot of people like to see. So from a tech standpoint, there's so many cool things you can do that really make the the experience of the guest phenomenal. And again, that leads to better reviews and ultimately, you know, maximizing your your performance. And so it is uh, integral to incorporate technology, especially nowadays, into whatever processes you you look to do. So, absolutely. And I'll put a disclaimer out there too. I mean, vet these companies. If if you do decide that you're you're using a channel manager and they have a marketplace where they offer other companies integration, or if you're just looking on your own for other companies out there that can assist you in your business. You know, we, you and I obviously have dealt with, you know, quite a few different companies from the tech side, the channel management side, uh, you know, just a little bit of everything, it seems like now. And there are some that I would definitely um, do my homework on, uh, you know, looking back on it, maybe a little bit stronger, but uh, now the ones that we're using, I'm, I'm thrilled with. And I really think uh, we've, we've found the right ones. It, Unfortunately, one of the big one of the big issues with this industry is that experience kind of rules out. You can't really read a guidebook fully to understand what's going to work best for you and your business and how you want to operate. It 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 is very um, hospitality driven, and I know a lot of us in the real estate space are a little bit more uh, maybe numbers driven or um, you know. We're, we're looking at just property and, and what it could potentially be worth down the road. A lot of the times appreciation is, is a big factor for a lot of us in this space. And when it comes to Airbnb, that's not necessarily the case. There's just some other factors that come into play that uh, you, you really have to kind of consider. Definitely. No, I couldn't agree more. So one of the things I'm, I'm I'm interested in is, you know, obviously we've been seeing a lot of changes in the space recently. Um, you know, we can obviously speak to the to the Louisville market regarding, you know, some of the changes that municipalities have 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 affected. But really, this this happens across the nation. And you know, I know in Nashville, for example, um, they've had a big problem with Airbnbs, where outside investors are coming in, buying these properties, and whole streets are becoming Airbnbs. And so the city itself has been trying to push for regulation as far as administering these 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 permits to be able to operate uh, uh you know these types of these 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 types of properties in a residential communities. So one of the things that I'm kind of curious about is what are you seeing here locally and then you know how does commercial come into play there? Sure. Uh so you know again with a commercial property you don't have to have a conditional use permit to operate a short term rental because the zoning of that property uh, is is commercial. And, and, you know, so here in Louisville, we have a lot of different zoning designations. And so there's any number of them that as long as it's a particular zoning, you can just go and you still have to register with the city, um, but you don't have to go through the process of obtaining a conditional use permit, which can take months and it's very tedious and uh, just it's expensive. So um, the commercial you know, short-term rentals are becoming increasingly more popular. And I think that's nationwide. I don't think that's just here locally. I know other cities, like you said, Nashville, I know Atlanta, uh, Hawaii, uh, you know, different areas of the country are, are implementing, you know, different sort of um, ordinances for their areas to, to kind of protect their cities from being overcrowded with short-term rentals you know not everybody wants a short-term rental right next door to them um and and i understand that so you know i do think there's also a difference between some of the hosts out there and and you know we won't accept every reservation that comes across you know our desk it just we know now some of the people that uh there's red flags that you can look for there's technology out there to help you find those red flags and even they will kill a reservation um, without your knowledge, because they found something that you could never have known uh, without what they do on the back end. So, um, you know, I, I think with commercial, it is better. Obviously, commercially zoned properties around the world are, they're zoned that for a reason. They're typically in commercial areas. A, a building that I have right now that I'm working to develop, as you know, um, 
very popular part of town, Butcher Town. It's right on Main Street. So that side of Main Street goes straight into downtown Louisville. Um, so Main Street, you know, commercial area, the entire corridor for the most part, commercially zoned. And so this property particularly, it, it's an old Camelback residence. Um, it, it does not fit the mold of the neighborhood. Directly across the street is an elementary school. Right next door is an architecture firm. And on the other side is a storage facility. And behind the building is the parking lot for the storage facility. So, uh, you know, that property, in my opinion, is perfect for short-term rentals because I don't have to worry about a neighbor on any of the four sides around me causing a disturbance for my guests. I also don't have to worry about my guests causing a disturbance for any of the neighbors around me. Uh, and that is particularly important when it comes to, uh, you know, short-term rentals as a whole. But that's, I think, why the commercial uh, zonings and the commercial properties are becoming more popular for that route. I'm sure I'm not the only one who's experienced the fact that, you know, when you put a short-term rental in a residential neighborhood, not everyone's going to love it. And it could cause issues on both ends, the guest side and the neighbor side. So the commercial space is important um, for that reason as well. But, um, you know, again, I think it, it still depends on the area and not every commercially designated property makes sense as a short-term rental. You know, you can take a 10,000 square foot warehouse and subdivide it into 10 different units, a thousand square feet a piece and, you know, put two beds and two bathrooms and all 10 units um, and, and put it up on any of the platforms and try to rent it. And some people, sure, they may be into that, but not everybody wants to stay in a warehouse for the night. So again, just things you have to kind of uh, consider. And, you know, with some of the supply that we are seeing here locally, and, and even some of the stuff I've seen nationwide, I don't know that people are really taking into account um, the fact that not every building is fit to be a short-term rental. Uh, and that goes for residential as well as commercial. Or on the flip side of it, especially from a commercial perspective, maybe the higher and better use is not a short-term rental. Maybe it is something uh, a little bit more fluid with the neighborhood or the market. And those are things that you know need to be taken into consideration. As you know, you know, adaptive reuse on some of this stuff. It, it takes time and it takes the right creative mind to come up with a good use for every space that's out there. And sometimes I think people are going the short-term rental route because it it's easy. It, it's incredibly easy. You know that you just have to put a bed, a couch, a TV, and somebody's going to rent it from you. So from that perspective, there's, there's I think, some issues doing you know, short-term rentals with commercial properties, but that's a, a personal take. And I, you know, there's definitely some that I've seen out there. And I think with the amount of, of time and energy that goes into being a host, um, I just think there could be better uses for some of these spaces instead of trying to uh, adapt them into more of a residential concept. Um, so, you know, that's yeah, my take. No, you're right. And, and I would say, you know, from the brokerage standpoint, I, I can speak to this a little bit because I've definitely got started to get I've had more requests for this type of thing. And and what what ends up happening is that, you know, some of a client of mine, for example, looks at a building and they're trying to pencil out the numbers. And for some reason, it's just not working out as a you know mixed use. So you have a down downstairs tenant that would be a commercially zoned tenant. And then upstairs, you may have apartments. And so the, the 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 conversation is slightly shifted and they say, OK, well, it's a good location. You know what they want for this property is a little bit you know, outside of what we can do as far as just these two uses, what if we incorporate a short-term rental concept? And especially if it's in a good area, you know, the the the, the demand may be there. And and obviously, you know, short-term rentals do outperform long-term rentals, especially if it's in a a, a hot area. Um, you can you can definitely command qu quite a bit more uh, per month as far as your revenue is concerned. And so, I've started seeing. You know, I've had a client recently that that they wanted to do like a and I you 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 were aware of this. They were looking to do like a you know, downstairs, their practice, they had their, their doctor of physical therapy. Um, and then upstairs, they had two apartments and they were going to try to see if they could do the short term rentals up, upstairs and then have their practice on the bottom. Therefore, they could qualify for owner financed, not necessarily owner financed, but they were going to utilize the SBA to purchase the building and then, you know, to qualify for the lower down payment amounts and, and more favorable, uh, you know, 
loan packages as a result of them being able to occupy at least 51% of the space. So there's different creative ways that you can get into the space on the commercial end and it could still be viable. It's just another tool in your toolkit, as they say. So, yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. So one more, one last question before we open to Q and a, I know we, we have some people in the chat that are already going typing away. So, you know, obviously there's a lot of information we shared today and I'm sure there's a lot more information out there, um, different resources that may be available. So what are, what are some of the you know best resources that you think uh, people can go to in order to learn more about, uh, you know, operating within the space? Sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I think you've got from a, a, a lot of the dynamic pricing tools that are out there, there's, you know, three that come to mind right off the top of my head. And I think a lot of them put out, a lot of good market information, you know, based on the trends that they see. And that's one really good way to consider getting into the space, maybe read some of the, the um, analytics that they've put out and read some of the year end information that they've put out some of the annual reporting. And that way you can understand better where the market is trending. Uh, what, what are some of the common themes they're seeing? And that really is one of the best ways to um, you know kind of explore this space a little bit more if you're not in it and you're considering getting into it those um, those articles really have a lot of uh, good information in them um, you, you know so uh, on top of that I've, I've watched some YouTube videos you know me I'm not huge on social media or, or anything of that nature and um, so I don't I don't particularly get into what other people have done necessarily, but I'm sure there is some excellent information um, out there on, you know, some of the different platforms. Uh, but I also would, would, you know, kind of tell people, you know, as a disclaimer, be careful what you hear and, and don't always take every, every host's perspective as the end all be all, because it's not, again, every, every home, Every property, every city, every state, every country, every continent, everybody has a, a different way that they're handling this new boom of short-term rental properties around the world. And I really think that at some point we may see a shift and a pullback. I know here locally in Louisville, Kentucky, a lot of people are saying the hotels are not threatened at all by uh, short-term rental properties. I don't think that's the case at all. There are certainly some people uh, who I've spoken to in, in the hotel industry that I would say um, are, are seeing the supply of short-term rentals gaining traction here locally. And we have, you know, hoteliers coming in trying to build um, new hotels left and right. They're popping up everywhere they can find enough land to make it happen. And I think that's always going to be the trend. Hotels have been here way longer than short-term rentals, and that will probably always be the case. Uh, plus, if these ordinances with the city continue to get more restrictive, I think you're going to see a, a heavy crackdown uh, pretty much everywhere, minus coastal areas, vacation towns, mountain towns, places where people are going to visit for a reason. Uh, but here locally, we have bourbonism, we have horse racing, uh, you know, we, we've got basketball. And um, other than that, you know, we're kind of a smaller uh, tourist destination. So for us, it'll be different than somebody who's, you know, down in Destin, Florida. So uh, yeah, you know, that's, that's kind of my take on it. No, for sure. And and I think those are all great points. And, and I'll even add to that briefly with, you know, I think there's no better value than speaking with operators locally. So if you could attend some, you know, investor meetups that where people, you know, actively own short-term rentals in your specific market, because again, short-term rentals are market specific. I think that is, you know, a good starting point. And then, you know, obviously these larger platforms like bigger pockets, I know they have like a thread that's dedicated to short-term rentals. So I'm sure that there's a lot of discussion happening on those platforms that, you know, share these different resources that, that may be of value to you guys. So those are two starting points that I think would be very valuable. And, you know, hopefully you guys gain some value from that. So, yeah. All right. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is we're going to open up to Q&A. Um, I want to make sure that we're able to ans answer your guys' questions. I'll be looking in the chat box and I'll also be looking on LinkedIn as well. So to start off, Stella. So, hey, Stella, uh, they ask, how do you search for short-term rentals? 
do you have a support system for people who are brand new in starting Airbnb? It's a good question. And I think that's a really common question. So there's not a tried and true method for searching, you know, for a, a viable short-term rental property. I think here again, locally in Louisville, Kentucky, one of the big things people are looking for is a commercially zoned property. That way they don't have to go through the permitting process of, you know, going, paying a bunch of money and, and potentially being denied. We are seeing a lot more denials come through from that, that side of, of um, you know, things as a host. Now, I would always tell you, try to find areas of town that have a lot going on. You're going to have a high, you know, supply of short-term rentals in those areas, probably going to have a higher price per square foot in those areas, but those are, are really going to be your, your key to success. I mean, I think you're always going to really have, um, you know, a, uh, a nice clientele uh, going into those areas and you can probably charge more in those areas, but there's, there's always, you know, the hidden gem out there and you are going to know your markets better than we know your markets. So you have to kind of do some research and figure out what may be an up and coming area, maybe what's a new development that's going into a certain part of town. Uh, you know, just think about why anybody would come in, uh, you know, to your, your city or your state or, or, you know, country or wherever. So, you know, that's probably the best advice I can give you. It's not like we really had a a true support system. We jumped in with both feet, uh, kind of on a whim. We figured we'd try something different, start something new, and we've had a lot of success in a short amount of time. So I'm I'm thankful for that. But you know, again, we are also seeing a trend going, uh, you know, the other direction. So you know, it's, it's you just yeah. always have to adapt. So the support system yeah. is something you kind of have to build internally. I I would say. Yeah, and I would say you know, obviously locally you know, going to these investor groups. I know the RIAs around the country, you know, there's, there's big different organizations like RIA. Um, yeah. I would imagine if you go to a RIA, there's gotta be people there that are actively owning real, uh, short-term rentals and they'll probably be able to give you a pretty good, uh, pretty good value there. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. So next up is, uh, Chastity. She asks, do you know of any companies that offer mentoring or educational information that would be helpful, such as podcasts, reviews of various channel companies, uh, company websites or YouTube channels. I think we kind of touched on that briefly a little bit earlier. I, you know, I, I'll say, you know, I, I think that if you go to these, you know, bigger pockets, for example, is probably a good starting point. And then you just search for short-term rentals and, you know, they have threads like li- long threads of people who ask a bunch of different questions about managing and operating short-term rentals. I'm sure on there, if you did a little bit of research, you could probably pull so much information um, about different channels, podcasts, you know, Um, as far as channel managers are concerned, I mean, that's just independent research, you know, you get out there, type it in Google and, you know, go through it. I mean, I know there's, there obviously the big ones are like, you know, guesty host away, um, uh, logify, you know, but again, you, you have to know the intricacies of each different platform and and understand what works best for you. So, all right. So Chastity also asks, uh, what precautions have you taken to prevent squatters? That's a good question. That is a good question. And so the good thing about short-term rentals compared to a long-term rental, again, you, you have to check your, your local laws on this question. But one of the biggest things is with the channel managers or with the different channels rather and your channel managers, there are some safeguards in place that are going to protect you. Obviously, it's not foolproof. People are going to do whatever they're going to do. And there's always going to be horror stories and I can't say we've ever been a victim of a squatter through a short-term rental, but we have, uh, you know, I, I have met cops at a property to escort people off the premises. Uh, that is kind of part of the, the job, unfortunately. And, um, you know, it's, people are always going to try to take advantage of, of the situation. And that's where the vetting process comes in. You kind of have to read between the lines sometimes make sure that you're seeing how many reviews people have uh make sure that you're you're especially with airbnb i know they have guidelines if if you allow instant booking versus you know reservation request there are a lot of different guidelines that that you can force a guest to follow before they're allowed to book your your property uh that's that's gonna hurt your revenue i'll tell you ahead of time um 
but, and, you know, at the end of the day, if your concern is safety and your property and all the things you should be concerned about as a landlord or property owner, then, you know, those are good, good safeguards to have in place. Uh, you know, for instance, with Airbnb, they have, you know, something where you can put, if the guest doesn't have a picture of themselves, then they're not allowed to book your property. But on VRBO, the guest almost never has a picture of themselves on their profile. So, you know, it, it's kind of a give and take. We have cameras, security cameras that are, are clearly designated on our listings to tell people, you know, that we have these, these recording devices on the premises. Uh, and that to me is enough to where I'm able to see their face when they, they check in and, and I know who I'm dealing with if something happens. Um, but great question. And unfortunately, there's, there's, you know, no uh, magic serum to, to prevent squatters from short term, long term, midterm, mm -hmm. any, any, any renter could potentially squat in your property. But with short term, again, if you follow your, your local city guidelines, the law is going to be different no matter, uh, you know, everywhere that you go and, and some places, uh, you know, if it's under 30 days being a short term rental you know, the police may be able to take action in that regard. Again, I, I'm not an attorney, so I don't, you know, I don't want to give any advice there, but just check your, your local laws to find out, um, you know, what you would have to do in that instance. Definitely. Oh, great, great point. All right. So Christian asks, how about using apartments for STRs? This is, this is a, it's funny. Uh, Raphael and I were talking about this at the gym this morning. So um, the, Apartment arbitrage is what it is referred to as, and I'm personally not a big fan of it. Um, you know, I've lived in apartments, so I just well, this, know. Well, this guy, this guy's an owner. You see, it says as an owner of an apartment building. So let's say that you own a 16plex. Oh, okay, okay. Let's say you own a 16plex and you're like, and instead of doing the, the short term or, you know. Sure. Long term. Uh, we just, yeah. Yeah, no, that that's hey, that's if you have um, an apartment building, I don't know how big it, it is, but I do know of people that will operate kind of like a, a mini motel uh, or a condo hotel, things like that. And and I think they're great. I think you can, you know, have a lot of success there. But a couple of things to consider is is um, and this is something that I didn't deal with personally, but, um, you know, a friend of mine dealt with they had multiple uh, units under the same roof. And essentially they provided guest check-in instructions to one guest and they, uh, went into the wrong room. So it, you have to be very careful. And if you're using technology, smart locks, things like that to assist you, you better make sure that it is a hundred percent solid all the time. There's no room for error with that stuff. Uh, that host in particular, um, you know, luckily no one was in the room at the time, it was newly turned over and it was good to go, but it was a larger room and they had a different guest that was checking into that room later that day who paid a higher price. So they couldn't ask these people to move. And unfortunately, the people who were supposed to stay in that room got stuck with the smaller room and, you know, bad reviews were left all around. The host tried to, uh, you know, provide a bottle of champagne to, uh, you know, make the problem go away. Um, and another disclaimer for you, I would never, ever provide alcohol to any guest ever. You're opening yourself up to a lot of liability. Even if you think you're doing, you know, your guest a favor by, you know, just saying, Hey, I'm sorry for the inconvenience. Here's a bottle of wine. Don't do it. They drink that they leave your property in their vehicle and they get in a wreck. That's on you. So, uh, just a little disclaimer there. No, for sure. No, that's, that's some good, good advice as well. Um, we'll go through about two more questions. We're running close to the hour. So I want to make sure we keep on time. So just as a comment, Christina said, I found that most hosts know their revenue, but not the net after all expenses. So not only ask about income, every city has different taxes, permit fees, utilities that are drastically different. That is a, that is a very fair point. So um, yeah, it's not, point. it's not just the, yeah, you, you can make, you know, let's say you make $4,000 a month from, from this thing. Like if your expenses are 3,900, then what is, you know? No, that's a great point. And I, I actually <laughs> emphasize this to a lot of people. They hear that people are bringing in $5,000 a month on a two bedroom, one bathroom property and, and their eyes light up. 
you know, for them, that is just the best thing since sliced bread. And they, they want to turn every little two bedroom, one bathroom property they have into a short term rental to get $5,000 a month. But to your point, the net is nowhere near that. The time value of money in this instance, it is, it, it's a lot of times it can be hard to calculate. The amount of times I have driven to a property to give somebody a fresh roll of toilet paper because my cleaner didn't leave out enough or more Tide Pods for the washing machine because my cleaner didn't leave out enough. All of those things add up. And so not even just talking about the net value that you're bringing in from you know a, a revenue perspective, but just your own time. There's a lot that goes into this business and that's where those systems uh, are beneficial. You know, uh, kind of going back to systems real quick with your cleaning company or your cleaning crews, whoever you're using, make sure you've got checklists of things for them to do every single time there's a turnover. And that way you can kind of alleviate some of those stresses. And, um, uh, you know, in my opinion, your, your net goes up. For sure. No, that's a good, good point. So last question, I just want to make sure we stay on time. And for those of you guys who have extra questions, I know there's a lot of questions in the, the chat. I just want to make sure we stick on the time. Um, I will, we will be, excuse me, we'll be providing uh, Barrett's contact information. Uh, on the in the description so if you guys are watching this on youtube it'll be in the description and obviously in, on the podcast format it'll be in the description as well but uh so last question um so nico um asks do you prefer single family homes over multifamily buildings if so why i'm assuming for them from the airbnb standpoint that's a tough one that really is that's a solid question and i don't think they're i wouldn't i wouldn't necessarily pick either you know, single family home versus multifamily. I'll say this from my experience as, you know, a property owner and a landlord of, of multifamily, I, I don't personally enjoy it. I I've ended up playing referee to my tenants a couple of times and I just don't care for that. So from a short-term rental perspective, that is amplified. Um, uh, you know, so I really don't care to be operating as, you know, host landlord, referee and everything else that that comes with the territory of, of being you know a, a short-term rental host so for me i i prefer single family homes now that's just personal preference because i've found that a lot of people if they're you know booking a short-term rental over a hotel they want a yard they want a full kitchen they want their own space they want the feel of being at home more than they want the feel of being in a confined little you know, two bed, you know, room, um, 30 floors up with, you know, no backyard and nowhere to take their dog out or anything like that. So I personally prefer short, uh, a single family residence, but at the same time, when it comes to, uh, you know, I've got single family residences kind of scattered all throughout here. And I, I have to drive from house to house, to house, to house which takes up time and, and that's value. So um, one thing I guess I would say to that is maybe try to get multiple houses in the same area to uh, cut down on that. And then you're kind of getting the best of both worlds. And, and that's what we've tried to do, uh, which is, it's been a lot better. Definitely. Well, thanks Barrett. And I mean, you know, you provide a whole lot of information, a lot of value on this episode. So we really do appreciate your time. Um, if people want to learn more about you and what you do, how would they get in contact with you? Uh, so I've got, uh, my website, it's a lodium re.com a L L O D I U M R E.com. Uh, that's my brokerage website. And there's also a link to, you know, our short-term rental direct booking website on there as well. Um, or you can, uh, email me Barrett B A R R E T T at elodium re.com. Great, great. And we'll include this show notes. So if you guys are watching this on YouTube, it'll be in the description. If you guys are listening to this in a podcast format, it'll be in the description as well. So again, thank you so much, Barrett. Thank you all so much who are uh, everyone who's tuning in. We greatly appreciate you guys coming and engaging with the podcast, uh, the, the meetup. Uh, we do this every other week. So feel free to come back and engage. And we look forward to seeing you guys next time. Awesome. Thanks, Raphael. Thanks for having me. Of course. We'll see you guys. Bye.